Hello, I'm a nostalgia critic. I remember it so you don't have to. Imagine Deadpool, Andy Kaufman, and Monty Python's Flying Circus made a Saturday morning cartoon. A superhero who saw crime fighting more as a side thing. Especially when there's more important things to do, like teach Norwegian. This is the Narwhal. Duna or Narquan. Perform a wedding for your hands. Or figure out which monkeys in the movie Congo were actually monkeys and which ones were guys in suits. That's a real monkey. No, that's some guy in a suit. Okay, but now that's a real monkey. No, that's another guy in a suit. Now that's a real monkey. That's a guy in a suit! We're gonna have to see this again. Oh, and remember when your mom wished you a good time at the prom? Have a good time now! What if that just repeated through the course of the night? Over? Have a good time now! And over? Have a good time now! And over? Have a good time now! You may think this kind of animated insanity came from something like Family Guy, or Adult Swim, or any number of YouTube videos. But the fact is, this combination of animation and troll humor predates them all. It's the 90s kinda-ish hit, Freakazoid. Produced by Steven Spielberg, this was a very different beast compared to his other productions like Tiny Toons or Animaniacs. And though it never got as big as those shows, it grew a cult following over the years. While this type of self-aware, almost non-humor at times has been done in the past, you could argue it's never been done in animation on as big a scale as this. Now, animated shows of this kind of humor are everywhere. But in the 90s, there wasn't really anything quite like this. Shows have knocked down the fourth wall in the past, but this show walked past the wall, chatted with the people on the other side, observed the snacks on the catering table, and discussed those snacks and the history of them in great detail. Whether they're, you know, religious, experiential or not, I love them, all of them, we'll hug after the show. To some, this could be off-putting, but to the select number of crazies and wackos that love this kind of non-sequitur humor, this was just the right amount of madness. Its energy contagious, its maturity obliterated, its lasting effects completely unique. And I'm here to talk with the people who made this possible. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever on Nostalgia Critic, I give you co-creator Tom Ruger and Freakazoid himself, Paul Ro- Uh, we've been on the show before. What? When? Animaniacs tribute. Oh shit, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this is the first time you're on the show talking about Freakazoid, right? I guess. Okay, okay, I'll just build up that angle. Cool. For the very first time on Nostalgia Critic talking about Freakazoid, co-creator Tom Ruger and Freakazoid himself, Paul Rudd! <laughs> it's, that, it's that dream come true! First of all, thank you for coming on my show just to come on my show and not promote some sort of product or event. Uh, no problem, Critic. We're, we're just happy to chat with you about anything. So the show was originally being developed by Batman producer Bruce Timm, as well as Paul Dini, who was tasked with making a superhero comedy. He drew up some characters and even tested a sort of demo with the Batman episode Beware the Creeper, mixing comedy and action. Bruce Timm, uh, his specialty was superhero stuff. Steven basically wanted a comedy show, where Bruce wanted a superhero show with comedic overtones. I think Steven was really trying to push it to be very, very, very comedic first, and that's just not something I think Bruce Tim was interested in doing. As far as the silliness, pretty much hit it out of the park. It, it may have gone even sillier than Stephen had anticipated. I would say that that's probably true. I, I wanted to do one of those funny things like, and you ever watch F Troop where Agarn says, there's no way I'm wearing a dress, and Forrest Tucker's like, yeah, you're wearing that dress, and then they wipe, <laughs> and Agarn's wearing a dress. <laughs> yoo -hoo! Seeing how time and budget were already low, everybody came running into Freaka so he with little time to prepare and even less time to figure out what kind of show it was going to be. Even in several episodes, they confess they don't always know what they want to keep around. My Freaka Lair! I didn't know you had one of these! Well, in this episode, anyway, you know, we're trying a lot of stuff out. We started in January developing the show and writing up stuff, and we were going to be on in September, so we had eight, nine months. As opposed to, say, like, Animaniacs, where we had, like, two years. <laughs> That's right, yes. The show was going to be greenlit. We were on. And we, th we didn't have anything. We didn't have a show. We didn't really know who was in it, and we knew there was a guy named Freakazoid in it. That's all we knew. We just started writing 
anything we could think of that had a superhero in it and was funny. That's why some of the early segments are just little strange little pieces like uh, Legends Who Lunch or Handman. Handman, you've come in the nick of time. I wouldn't let you down, Freaky Bazaar. Oh, just stop. What? This is stupid. Part of what makes the humor work is Bruce Timm's designs. Having a more human look and scale, they're less stretchy than, say, Wacko Warner or Plucky Duck. The fact that they're more physically grounded offsets the strange and childish humor they're constantly partaking in. If, say, Ren and Stimpy were doing this material, it wouldn't have worked as well, but much like Monty Python, the more human and adult they seem, the funnier it is when they do something strange and ridiculous. Was this always the intention? Hmm. If we say yes, I think it'll make us look pretty smart. Can then say yes? Yes. 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 Unlike other superhero shows, even comedies, Freakazoid started off more as a variety show. It showcased many strange characters like Lord Bravery, The Huntsman, and Fanboy, who did absolutely nothing superhero related in any episodes. Well, don't get me wrong, they tried to get to the superhero stuff, but the slow forces of reality always prolonged it to a point where we never actually see any of it. Oh yes, let me get the tea! You forgot the sugar! Most people your age die. Why won't you? In shows like The Tick, reality will get in the way too, but he did eventually fight crime. Here, it's a complete waste of time every episode. What can I say, Huntsman? Crime is still down. Well, maybe I'll go to the all-night aquarium. When we were given the go-ahead to start working on the show, we have to just start generating material, writing stupid little things about superheroes. I had about 60 to 70 pages of just little, little tiny skits. Steven, I think he liked them, but thought they were like schizophrenic and nasty. <laughs> One of the early sketches I did was a uh, moron, which uh, I think insulted Steven right off the bat. <laughs> so let's bury that. <laughs> well, that's our show. I hope you had as much fun watching it as we had making it. I've got my own party! You do not! Come to think of it, I hope you had more fun watching it than we had making it. Paul, of course, came up with, which was also essential, an origin story, which uh, I think was like the fifth or sixth episode to air. John McCann and I, uh, we were sort of being more practical, like how does Freakazoid turn into Freakazoid, and days think, thinking about that, and, and we came back into Tom and said, we think we know how he turns into Freakazoid, and I think you said, I could care less. <laughs> We're, re we're really late, so I, n I need some scripts. I don't care how we... It could change from week to week. I don't care. But he also figured out how one of his superpowers was flying, which, which was just him running around going... Psh. Yeah. Even the origin of Freakazoid isn't revealed until episode 7. But maybe that's so they would have time to obtain their knockout celebrity guest. The president of the Motion Picture Association of America, Mr. Jack Valenti. Holy shit, they know what the kids want! Bum, bum, bum. The origin story came about because I think halfway through the season, Tom had a brilliant idea. It's like, wh why don't we tackle how this all happened? <laughs> you spend far too much time with your computer. It's my life. That's so very, very sad. I was playing around and I started writing Jack Valenti, who was the president of the Motion Picture Association of America, just as a joke. The only note we got back on that whole episode was Steven said, I can get you Jack Valenti. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, man. I'd like to know how Freakazoid got his start as a superhero. What were the special circumstances? My home is made of adobe. I think that was one of the favorite things that we ever did, because here's this guy, he was in the Johnson administration. That's the only reason I'm doing this is yeah, from Steven, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I tell you, when he comes into a room, the first thing you see are the cheeks. <laughs> he leads with the cheeks. Yeah. I'm Jack Valetti, and these are my cheeks. God bless him. Have a good time now. The guest stars on the show often have articulate, commanding, almost Shakespearean voices that have done a wide range of theater and film. Their demanding presence just makes the humor all the more enjoyable when you realize how much their talent is being hilariously wasted on pure immaturity. Now look at this duck. It's just a duck. Oh no, my friend. It's a plain old duck. No, it's a very special duck because there is a guy in it. Well, we did have some great guest stars. I think there were certain things that Paul wanted to hear from them. Ricardo saying, you are the weenie. He's such a weenie. I am not a weenie. You are the weenie!
I remember Peter Hastings running into my office and going, you're going to have Ricardo Malbon say Uncle Fudge is cooking lab? And I go, yeah. And he goes, you, they didn't have to pay me anymore just to have them say that was awesome. This man is giving his wife kissings and lovings. Then a monkey appears and she thinks it's the guy. Look out, woman, it's a monkey. My personal favorites are David Warner as the Lobe, whose voice is so intimidating when he's being evil. The Lobe began his treacherous reign of terror. Yet so funny when he's being a whiny crybaby. No, now that wasn't me. It's true, really. I knew I shouldn't have put that on there. Dum, dum, dum. And of course, Ed Asner as Cosgrove, whose deadpan deliveries of absolute insanity are an art unto themselves. We've been through a lot together. Now go away. That means we'll have to walk through duty water. I always liked the little teacup ride. How come you never got married? Because I like meat too much. You could be married and still eat a lot of meat. I didn't know that. Cosgrove is sort of an invention from John McCann. He only put him in one script, his Dance of Dune script. So the first time Ed Asner came to record, he was sort of like just there by the microphone, just reading over his lines, not, not even acting, going, uh, hey, Freakazoid, do you want to go for a mint? And I remember John McCann went, that <laughs> is what I want. And he's like, you don't want me to act, do anything, or act? And John McCann's like, no. That! Ed would come in and go, Ed, don't worry, you don't have to act. And he'd go, yeah. And that's how that happened. It might also have, believe it or not, the most insane Tim Curry performance ever. It's time to play! And if you know Tim Curry, that is quite an accomplishment. They barred me from the universities. Who's crazy now? Hmm? Who's mad now? Hmm? Tried the casserole. Tim Curry came ready to play. I was always amazed because Andrea Romano would send out the scripts and they would have them for a week. Yeah. And uh, invariably, every single big star we had, they came ready. So obviously, Tim Curry had thought about how he was going to do all that. They called me mad, insane, Wendell! <laughs> and he just went like through the roof and we're like, they called me mad, insane, Wendell! There was a camera crew there. Um, to film Tim Curry being there. And Jonathan Harris walked in, and Jonathan's like, is there a camera crew because the star is here? <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yes, Jonathan, he goes, Ugh. Have a good time now. Where Tiny Toons seem mainly for kids, and Animaniacs seem mainly for kids and adults, Freakazoids seem mainly not just for adults, but for adults who love obscure, even outdated references. Christ, there's a musical send-up to Hello, Dolly! For no reason at all! And it goes on for a long time! Bonjour! Oui, bonjour! Lovey! Oh, bonjour! Gosh, bonjour! Lovey! You have to wonder if this worked more because it was a kid show and therefore fit less? Or if being on a more grown-up outlet like Adult Swim would have changed things? We were trying to amuse ourselves, make each other laugh, and that was our goal. I don't think we ever said, can we get away with that? It was, it, the thought was, I find this really funny. What do you guys think? Oh yeah, I think that's really funny. And that was always the goal. It wasn't to pull the wool over anyone's eyes or no. to trick we anybody. Trying, we weren't trying to slip something past. Yeah. As far as Hello Dolly, the Hello Dolly number, uh, that just seemed a natural progression. For whatever reason, I thought it would be funny to have a, sort of a, a Hello Dolly component to it. We never thought, oh boy, our kids are not going to like Hello Dolly. We didn't really care hair, which clearly shows because the number goes on for five minutes. <laughs> I think it took like uh, seven months to uh, just animate that scene. It, man, whew, that's weird stuff. <laughs> With that said, did anyone ever say no? Like, anyone? We weren't being closely supervised. No. Uh, the goal was to, to get the thing done, get it out there. The only thing I recall uh, where they said, no, you can't run these, we made these cruise ship commercials, which oh, were, right, yeah. uh, Based on uh, a cruise line, they were very somber. You can relax on our cruise ships. Everything is nice. So we did these uh, commercials where we don't have any footage to show you <laughs> from Freakazoid because we're way behind schedule. And uh, But we had cruise ship footage, uh, pictures of cruise ships behind it. But the lawyers at Warner Brothers said, no, these are too close to the real commercial, you can't, we'll get sued. One of you at some point must have just stated, no, this is too obscure, too silly, too crazy. No, we would only say no to each other, like, eh, that's not funny, or I don't really think that's gonna fly. I remember John McCann and I, we, we struggled a little bit with Hero Boy, like bringing him back and stuff. 
Uh, but it, then we were like, ah, let, let's just let's just do more hero boys. So, but I was voiced by John McCann. Was voiced by John McCann. I must succeed. 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 Lord knows I wouldn't know anything about obscurity. Of course. Everybody gets that. In season two, the format changed slightly to focus more on Freakazoid. Imagine, focusing on the star of the show. Characters like Lord Bravery and the Huntsman ask what the hell happened to their role. Freakazoid has them wash his car, and the episode ends. It fits the show's nature, of course, but was it tough losing those characters and changing the format? Our second season, uh, you went off to do other things. Road Rovers and right. other stuff. John and I were like, well, who will produce it? We don't want to do that. Jean McCurdy took us to lunch, and she said, I, I really need you to do this, and I, I'm holding a knife under the table. <laughs> we were like, okay, we'll do it. We had a meeting at Amblin, I think, with Jamie Kellner and all the big Warner Brothers mucky mucks, and they all decided that we should not do any more silly little pieces but half hour stories. But little did they know, we would just be like, we'll just do longer stupid things. <laughs> I didn't mind it so much. I think it opened me up anyway to do weirder stuff, but that's just me. Oh, well, you had more time to do weirder yeah. stuff. Sadly though, the audience for Freakazoid was not growing as big as the studio wanted. Every time a new time slot was given, it would move around the following week. 7 a.m. It's not the time the people who want to watch this show are up. Well, I think the constantly changing air times kind of sort of killed us on the WB. The WB had this new campaign, Big Kids Go First. So they put our show on at 7 a.m. <laughs> Big kids were asleep. Then we ultimately got bounced over to a Cartoon Network. We had incredibly great numbers, and there was talk of them uh, ordering more episodes, but yeah. alas, not did not happen. In the final episode, most of the villains, allies, and guest stars are all called back to sing We'll Meet Again. Was there an awareness that this would probably be the final episode? They knew. Paul yeah. and John knew. WB hated us, like, a lot. When I was writing that last episode, we knew we were canceled, and when I finally started writing We'll Meet Again and all that stuff, um, I was like, man, this is, this is, this is kind, kind of sad. And by the way, I think that was one of the only musical pieces we ever licensed, and it cost a fortune. Jean McCurdy had seen Norm Abram at some convention in New York and she came back and I saw her in the office. She said, oh, I saw Norm Abram. And I go, boy, he'd be a great guy to have on Freakazoid. And I was kind of joking. And uh, <laughs> she said, well, I can get him. He, and he took acting classes for like six months yes. in preparation for the show. Yes. But maybe it's not the end of Freakazoid as we know it. What's Freakacon? Freakazoid's popularity sort of is on the upswing. People want to talk about it a lot. <clears throat> Our idea was to sort of bring a uh, convention together. And we talked, you know, we talked with various people. We looked into uh, Radio City Music Hall. Could we, you know, could we make a deal there? And we c couldn't quite come to terms. Then we tried, you know, Staples Center, Los Angeles. Couldn't quite. Almost. Almost. Couldn't quite make a deal. So, but then we, we finally have a new venue. Um, and uh, uh, it's Tom's Garage. It's an intimate space. Kind of answer questions for the first time uh, live. Have people write questions and we'll answer it. Paul Dini's gonna be there. Paul, Paul Dini. We have Joe Leahy coming. We have Stephen Julie Bernstein coming who are going to be sharing their musical gifts. There is a contest out there for people to reinvent their idea of Freakazoid fanboy or fangirl. Make a video of them saying why Freakazoid is probably the best superhero ever. Uh, and dressed up as the, their fan idea. Right. So we want to get as many people uh, tuning into this live event. On March 15th, 5 p.m. Pacific time, go to the Facebook page and write in questions that we'll be answering. Well, if you're a Freakazoid fan, that is definitely worth checking out. Freakazoid is strange, crazy, and doesn't apologize for any of it. It's the kind of humor done by people who half the time don't even care if you find it funny as long as they find it funny. That kind of love and dedication for your own jokes is both so odd and yet so passionate you can't help but find it intriguing. Freakazoid is certainly not everybody's show, but in a kid's market that tries to get as many demographics as possible, that truly does make it unique. 
It doesn't satirize what's popular, it satirizes what it loves. It doesn't get megastars you know, it gets fun people they've always wanted to work with. It's not Tiny Toons, Animaniacs, or Pinky and the Brain, it's its own totally abstract creature. It's insane, it's weird, it has to be seen to totally get it or not get it. It's one of a kind and a lot of people worked hard to make it that way. Thank you guys so much again for talking to me about this crazy ass show. Thank you. No you. You. <laughs> Just wanna eat you up. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> have a good time now. I'm the nostalgia critic, I remember it so you don't have to. You could be married and still eat a lot of meat. I didn't know that. <laughs>